Right on cue, American industry consistently delivered brand new gadgets, devices and machines designed to make life easier and more convenient. During the 50s, factories presented Americans with such new items as the automatic car transmission, the electric clothes dryer, dishwashers, the long playing record, the Polaroid camera, and the automatic garbage disposal unit. Americans also bought in record numbers older products, such as vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, most stylishly in harvest gold and avocado green, electric ranges and freezers. Thanks to agri-corporations such as Green Giant and Bird's Eye Foods, frozen foods, initially mainly vegetables, were marketed widely for the first time in the 1950s. Eventually one could buy a frozen dinner, entree and dessert, which went from freezer to dinner table in less than 45 minutes. TV dinners were the brainchild of the Swanson Company, another mass producer of processed foods, who provided families with complete frozen meals so they could eat their dinner while watching their favourite TV shows. No respectable middle class home was without the latest black and white television set, placed centre stage in the living room as the most important and expensive piece of household furniture. From their favourite viewing spots, the family watched the nightly news with Shay Huntley and David Brinkley, or their favourite sitcom, such as the most popular I Love Lucy or Father Knows Best. One of the many paradoxes of post-war social change, as witnessed by the advent of television and the middle-class lifestyle that the tube helped to define, was that many suburban nuclear families lost cohesion and the kinship that the family dinner table had once fostered and sustained. Indeed, dinner time was often the only time during the day that all family members gathered in one place, shared food and drink, and reaffirmed companionate relationships with the advent of television and TV dinners, such interaction in many suburban homes disappeared completely. Every night the household gathered for hours in front of the television, absently eating their frozen dinners and staring at a black and white screen, which not only entertained, but also bombarded viewers with ads, encouraging the purchase of even more things, must-haves for sustaining the modern suburban lifestyle. In that environment, families became increasingly impersonal entities, with relationships among members more superficial than genuine. The exchanges at this new dinner table revolved around what was being watched on television and discussions of the show's plot or the surprise of a particular episode's ending. Commonality extended to collective guffawing as Lucy Ricardo engaged in yet another of her harebrained schemes always ending up in catastrophic hilarity as she tried to find a way to break free from the shackles of domesticity. Ironically, for many suburban homes, the only traditional family dinner tables they saw were on television. As many of the most popular series, such as Ozzie and Harriet, Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best, were created to reinforce the traditional nuclear family and attendant values all portrayed dinner time as a family gathering, with members discussing the day's events and family issues, bonding as families once did in pre-suburbia. Even though all these TV families lived in su suburban neighbourhoods, just like those of the majority of their viewers, television thus became a magic mirror that both reflected and distorted reality in which everyone lived a white middle-class life. Interestingly, many hippies, the majority of whom grew up in such bland, shallow and homogenised suburban enclaves, tried to resurrect in their experiments in communal living the traditional family dinner hour, which to them represented authenticity via the sharing of food and conversation, the bonding many hippies desperately sought from among themselves and their new families, an intimacy that had been sadly missing in many of their respective suburban homes. Virtually all of the decade sitcoms displayed an idealised image of suburbia and middle class family life and gender roles. Supportive, apron clad, pearl necklaced, high heeled housewives a la June Cleaver, benign but sagacious fathers who materialised at dinner time 
in a grey flannel suit, the essential attire for corporate climbers. To resolve the day's petty crises and wise-cracking kids, almost exclusively boys, who get into amusing scrapes or trouble at school, but ultimately recognise and accept their parents, really their father's, authority and wisdom. Moreover, the families portrayed in the sitcoms were WASP. No families with ethnic last names had their own shows, even though increasing numbers of former immigrants were making their way to suburbs and acculturing WASP values and expectations. In addition, none of the families were blue collar, save Jackie Gleason's characters, as well as the rest of the cast of The Honeymooners. And of course, none were African-American, Hispanic or Asian-American, nor were they apartment dwelling or single parent or multi-generational families. In short, the America portrayed on television was suburban, white and white collar, Anglo-Saxon and Protestant. Indeed, to the leftist critics of mass culture, television was one more weapon in the capitalist arsenal of class manipulation, numbing the masses to their own alienation, thus furthering the elite's hegemonic control of society. To people who vaguely fit the image, television confirmed their vision of America, that only white, mostly wasp, middle-class suburbanites had access to, and were entitled to such abundance and creature comforts. Those on the outside longed for the good life shown on television, but they knew firsthand about the diversity, discrimination and deprivation that television ignored. 1950s Hollywood was as guilty as the television studios in promoting and reinforcing this fantasy of the United States as one big happy suburb, an American society in whose citizens were devoted to family and traditional values. D- despite the release of some menacing monster movies, such as Them, The Thing, or Invasion of the Body Snatchers, or other controversial pictures such as the 1957 classic, The Defiant Ones, the majority of films were upbeat, frothy, silly slapstick comedies, such as Bedtime for Bonzo, featuring future president Ronald Reagan as parent of a chimpanzee, or rollicking but light-hearted musicals such as the sexist Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Five of the ten films awarded the Best Picture Oscar in the 1950s were of such a genre, or escapist epics, such as An American in Paris, Around the World in 80 Days, and Ben-Hur. Not to be excluded from celebrating both domesticity and the 1950s America as the land of opportunity and abundance was the technologically brilliant but politically conservative Walt Disney, whose 1956 animated film Lady and the Tramp had a mongrel street dog and his dainty pedigreed mate achieve a canine version of suburban domestic stability and bliss. Disney's movies, as well as his weekly primetime Sunday night television show, not only promoted traditional family values, but American's historic righteousness, virtue, courage and heroism as well. Disney's spectacular theme park, which opened up in 1955 in Anaheim, California, one of Southern California's many suburban heartlands, became the physical manifestation of Disney's idyllic image of the United States. Indeed, at the time, there existed no other place in the country where one could literally immerse oneself in a mythic version of America as the ideal and untroubled society, past, present and future. Beginning with a nostalgic stroll down Main Street, USA, built to look like a small town America, circa the 1890s, and ending with a technological utopia of Tomorrowland, USA. From its inception, Disneyland and later Disney World in Florida, catered to a newly affluent white clientele seeking leisure time diversion on a grand sensory and expensive scale. On the basis of income level, by the beginning of the 1960s, demographers claimed that 60% of white Americans had attained middle class status. Included in that category were many previously socially disenfranchised and culturally marginalised working class ethnics who by the end of World War II had finally worked their way towards whiteness. Some had achieved their improved status 
through professional sports, such as baseball or boxing, or through their participation in the war effort, either as soldiers or factory workers. Such engagement showed loyalty and patriotism and led to acceptance by mainstream WASP society. With wartime savings in their pockets, a GI Bill offering low interest loans, a booming economy that provided plentiful job, or job opportunities and security, and most important, confirmation as white Americans, the ethnic working class was ready to step into the previously WASP-dominated middle class. Indeed, by the end of the 1950s, the creation of privately owned single-family dwelling by William Levitt and other tract home innovators and developers, and financed by banks whose risk was underwritten by the federal government, had become the norm for working Americans. How easy was it for post-war white Americans to purchase a home? Compared to today, unfathomably easy. For only 5% down of the purchase, nothing down for veterans, and 30 years to pay, an XGI could buy a new tract home with no down payment and instalments of only $56 a month on an average purchase in 1950 of $7,990. As Time magazine noted, at that time, white Americans could buy a home more easily than they can buy a $2,000 car on the instalment plan. Regardless of ethnicity or profession, the premier sign of middle-class status was the financial means to buy a new tract home in one of the myriad new suburban housing developments that proliferated throughout the United States in the 1950s. From the 1950s on, owning a new ranch style in California or Cape Cod, single family home in suburbia came to define middle class existence, becoming part and parcel of the American dream and remaining so for the majority of Americans down to the present. The post-war partnership of government and private enterprise made home, own, home ownership available to Americans previously excluded from such a privilege. And in the process, such policies resulted in a wider diffusion of traditional WASP middle-class values. The provisioning of such a benefit as home ownership to working class Americans reduced any potential for class conflict in the post-war years and secured the loyalty of blue collar citizens to the government and to preserving the status quo for decades to come. In many ways, labour's access to land and home in the post-war years represented writ large continued homage to the Jeffersonian Republican ideal that by extending property ownership to a greater number of citizens, the number of individuals with a stake in society concomitantly increases, and thus the number of people willing to safeguard established socio-political and cultural institutions, values, norms and more. Even as late as the 1930s and 1940s, this particular tenant of the Jeffersonian ethos still resonated with American political leaders, as both presidents Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt publicly affirmed the inextricable correlation between home ownership and vested interest in preserving the American way of life. According to Herbert Hoover, quote, the present large proportion of families that own their own home is both the foundation of a sound economic and social system and a guarantee that our society will continue to develop rationally as changing conditions demand, unquote. Moreover, pundits from the 1920s through to the 1950s agreed that ownership of homes is the best guarantee against communism and socialism and the various bad isms of life. It is not an infallible guarantee, but owners of homes usually are more interested in safeguarding our national history than our renters and tenants. Over a decade later, FDR reasserted his predecessor's commitment to ensuring that the United States would continue on its path towards becoming a nation of middle-class home owners. For, quote, a people who own a real estate, uh, sorry, a people who own a real share in their own land is unconquerable, unquote. As we'll be seeing in a later chapter, blue-collar middle-class Americans in particular viewed the hippie movement with the greatest contempt and fear, for they perceived that the hippie ethos was a threat, threat to all they had accomplished in the post-war years their stakes in society and their response to the hippie menace was to ignite 
one of the most determined backlashes in American history to eradicate from the nation's political and socio-cultural landscape all those they believe responsible for having defiled the sanctity of the American dream. By the late 1960s and into the early 70s, both blue and white collar middle America disdained all members and manifestations of the youth counterculture and referred to all such individuals and affinity groups as hippies. It was in these more affluent, predominantly WASP suburban enclaves where the majority of hippies would be born and raised, and it was the mentality and lifestyle associated with suburbia that they came to reject. An alleged plastic environment in which an unbounded and crass acquisitiveness pervaded all denizens, transforming them into shallow, externally directed people, void of individual identity and driven by a passion for consumption and security. Soon to be hippies, would flee from such an existence, searching in urban enclaves or in remote rural areas for a more authentic, spiritually uplifting and communal way of living. It simply was not enough to be the beneficiaries of a people of plenty. No, m no doubt many suburbanites succumbed to this peer dictated sociability and conformity. And despite the subsequent juvenile condemnations of such an existence, for the majority of white middle-class Americans, suburbia met a need and fulfilled a dream. As millions of nouveau middle-class citizens pursued their vision of the American dream, with which a new home in the suburbs became synonymous, they resented those who questioned that aspiration. To upwardly mobile white Americans, cultural critics, youthful rebels, and civil rights protesters were unwelcome naysayers amid the abundance and optimism suffusing the decade's burgeoning consumer culture. Although the lion's share of future hippies came from suburbia, comparatively few came from blue-collar, ethnic middle-class neighbourhoods, whether suburban or urban. Regardless of geographic location, in the less affluent working-class suburbs, the majority of those young people retained their parents' traditional ethos, which became more conservative as their prosperity and security stabilised. Such parents were less inclined to indulge their progeny, insisting that their kids get jobs when not in school. And for the majority of such families, upon graduation from high school, obtaining a steady job in the local manufacturing plant or steel mill was more valuable than going to college. Serving in the military was also important for many families, as a way for the family to demonstrate their continued pride patriotism and loyalty to a nation that had so richly rewarded them with acceptance and bounty. Upon completion of service, young men usually returned to the neighbourhood, got a job, perhaps married a high school sweetheart and almost immediately started a family. Family bonds and obligations were strong in such ethnic enclaves and moving away from the community was frowned upon, even if it meant an opportunity for upward mobility. Family traditions and values of ethnic working class suburban youth, coupled with limited experience and exposure to the countercultural movement, caused many to reject the hippie lifestyle and ethos. They felt only disdain for the hippie movement to find an alternative existence that challenged the status quo. Even though many working class youth desperately quietly, and some not so quietly, questioned that same soul sucking conformity from which their more affluent WASP counterparts were determined to break free. Helping to drive increasing numbers of white middle-class Americans to the suburbs was the desire for larger, more open living spaces to accommodate the surprising baby boom explosion of the years 1946 to 1964. This particular population increase was perhaps the most amazing social trend of the post-war era, and the generation of children born during this time gave rise to the future hippies. The family loomed large in 1950s American culture as post-war citizens, having put marriage and family on hold during the Depression, written 1930s, or the war turn early 40s, and ready to resurrect with a passion traditional family life. To this particular generation of Americans who longed for stability, security and traditional values, no institution better embodied such virtues than the nuclear family. By the close of 1946, one year after World War II had ended, 3.4 million babies had been born, the most ever in a one-time period in the United States history. And there were more babies to come, more than 4 million every year from 1954 to 1964, 
when the boom finally subsided. As a result, the nation's population leaped from 130 million in 1940 to 165 million by the mid-1950s, the largest increase in the Republic's history. The total numbers of babies born between 1946 and 1964 was 76.4 million, accounting for almost two-fifths of the nation's overall population of 192 million. The early boom was a result of millions of post-oppression, post-war Americans marrying young in late teens to early 20s to start a larger family sooner and to have two, three or four children in succession and perhaps even more later. The generation responsible for the boom's duration, however, was composed of younger folk, most of whom were born in the early to mid-1930s and thus were in their late teens or early 20s by the late 40s and early 50s. These people were more likely to marry than young people had been in the 1930s, primarily because they recalled no deprivations, the Great Depression, and became young adults during one of the most secure and prosperous eras in post-war history. As in so many other capacities in the post-war years, the nation's economic vitality, coupled with optimistic perceptions of sustained prosperity, drove social change in post-war America, of which the ever-growing numbers of people moving upward into middle classes reflected. Not only did suburban growth proceed at a sizzling pace in the 1950s, but so did population migration as well, especially to the West. In the post-war years of the nation, one of the most significant demographic shifts in history happened, as eventually millions of citizens poured into the Sunbelt states of Texas, Arizona, and especially California. Returning GIs from the Pacific Theatre found that the Golden State's beautiful beaches and mountains, temperate climate, exciting avant-garde cities, most exceptionally San Francisco, and plentiful jobs, too alluring not to stay and start their new life. They set to work in well-paying, cutting-edge industries, such as electronics, plastics, and aeronautics, as well as in construction, homes, schools, hospitals, and freeway system. If any state became synonymous with suburbia, it was California, which witnessed the most explosive and all-encompassing suburban growth in the post-war period. In many ways, and in the view of many Americans, by the end of the 1950s, California, particularly the, late, the, the greater Los Angeles area of Southern California and the Bay Area surrounding San Francisco, came to define, writ large, the quintessential suburban lifestyle and mentality. Although California became the ultimate definition of suburban America, it was Northeasterner William Levitt who paved the way to suburbia for the Golden State. Levitt pioneered a process of suburban home construction on a massive scale, becoming the most renowned builder in the post-war era. During the war, Levitt, who never liked cities, witnessed the fantastic gains in productivity associated with assembly line techniques and believed he could apply such a method to home construction and thus deliver low cost, one story, single family homes to tens of thousands of eager white Americans longing for their own freedom of space. To keep construction costs down, Levitt vertically integrated his entire operation and standardized every phase of the building process. From laying out streets, hooking up utilities, pouring concrete slab foundations and using pre-fabricated walls and frames assembled on site by non-union workers who Levitt paid well above the prevailing wage scale to avoid potential strikes. Consumers, depending on whether they were ex-GI or regular folk, paid $56 to $65 per month on a purchase price of less than $8,000 for roughly a 1,100 square foot house with a kitchen and dining room a living room, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and an expandable attic. On a 60 by 100 lot, with small fruit trees or evergreens. In many instances, buying a tract house cost less per month than renting a city apartment. The houses were well constructed and generous for that time in their amenities, providing central heating, built-in bookcases, closets, fireplaces, as well as appliances. 8-inch Bendix television sets, refrigerators, stoves and washing machines. 
Levitt developed his first suburban extravaganza, 17,000 homes accommodating more than 80,000 people on a one-time potato field site 30 miles from New York City, near Hempstead, Long Island. Out west, particularly in California, scores of William Levitts emerged, taking advantage of plentiful, undeveloped, cheap land that seemed to be everywhere in the Golden State, perfect for a new tract home construction on a more capacious scale than could be built in the Northeast. The ranch look, pioneered by Henry J. Kaiser and Henry Dugler in Southern California, became the quintessential Californian style suburban home. Defined by picture windows and sliding glass doors that opened to a grass backyard or to a patio or to a wooden deck and swimming pool, these homes were designed to showcase the possessions within as well as to open to the the house and the family activities to neighbourhood scrutiny. In order to foster community spirit, suburban developers added schools, swimming pools, tennis courts, athletic fields with little league diamonds, shopping malls and even hospitals. One of the first and grandiose of all of these all-encompassing community tract home projects occurred in Lakewood, California, on an old sugar beet field about 10 miles southeast of Los Angeles. There, a consortium of three different home construction enterprises combined to build what was heralded in 1950 as the city they built in six months. A new house was completed every seven and a half minutes, 40 to 60 houses per day, with a record of 110 completed in a single day. As one of Lakewood's original residents told an interviewer in 2003, she watched just bean fields transformed into an entire community. Quote, all these little houses has, has just sprung up like mushrooms. I couldn't believe it. It was just like the Wizard of Oz. I mean, it was just astonishing. Up one street and down the other were all these framed houses going up. It really, it was really like seeing a fairy tale take shape in front of your eyes. You just couldn't believe it went up like that fast. Then all of a sudden, all the grass grew and the trees were planted. And here you were, unquote. For young members of the aspiring middle class, suburbia was a haven of security, stability, convenience and sociability. Millions of Americans bought these houses as fast as the builders could put them up. To the point that by 1960, over one quarter of the nation's population lived in what the Census Bureau defined as suburban areas. The nation's largest buildings, the nation's largest builders, were answering the prayers of millions. By the close of the 1950s, home building had become one of the most important forces driving the post-war economic boom and middle-class prosperity. As a result the suburban industrial complex had emerged, led by such individuals as William Levitt and his equally powerful Californian counterparts, who would over the next several decades, regardless of the environmentally destructive nature of their industry, keep the bulldozer in the countryside. Not all Americans agreed that suburbia represented the realisation of the American dream. House Beautiful asked, is this suburbia the American dream or is it a nightmare? Regardless of locale, tracked home builders destroyed natural environments, upset ecosystems and ploughed under fruit orchards while turning fields and pastures into absolute streets. Although the principal motivation for moving the suburbs was affordable shelter, at times equally important to urban migrants was the opportunity to live in a more, quote, natural setting to reconnect with the nation's pastoral history. Clever developers thus named their projects according, accordingly to reinforce or promote such nostalgia. Popular names for eastern tracks were Crystal Stream, Robin Meadows and Stony Brook. In California, builders played upon the Golden State's idealised bucolic Spanish heritage, naming their, products, their projects Villa Serena, Tierra Vista or Rancho Cordova. While they continued their routine destruction of the woods, meadows and fields they honoured in their place names, architectural and cultural critics moaned the monotony of house after house with only the slightest difference in exterior look, size and landscaping, and inhabited by people, the majority of whom were cut from virtually the same socio-economic cloth and race 
and ethnicity were all white and were willing to sign agreements to keep their suburban neighborhoods as bland and as sterile as when they first moved in. Indeed, Levitt Town rules initially required homeowners to mow their own lawns every week, forbade putting up fences and outlawed hanging washing outside on the weekends. At the decade of the 1950s were on, owning a home in suburbia was insufficient proof that one had truly arrived. One's home had to be equipped with all the latest accoutrements and thus peer pressure to keep up with the Joneses ident- intensified the sense of mass conformity and conspicuous consumption that increasingly came to encompass and define middle-class suburban life in America. In all this, a profound irony existed. Those who had left the city in hopes of finding greater privacy now found themselves enveloped in a form of group living that had crushed privacy and undermined individualism as the vogue of togetherness and group participation reigned supreme. Perhaps the song Little Boxes 1962, by folk singer Malvina Reynolds, best captured the growing fear among many that the suburbs reflected the homogenization of American society and culture, a place where homes, these little boxes, and people were, quote, all made out of ticky-tacky, and they all just looked the same. One of the harshest critics of suburbia was the cultural historian Lewis Mumford, author of The City and History, 1961. Mumford maintained that suburban developers were destroying the modern city by turning them into sprawling megalopolises. As thousands of urban folk would move to the suburbs, empty the city of its most dynamic people and cause, over time, the city's physical decay as well as its cultural, intellectual and spiritual decline. Most alarming to Mumford was that the suburbia was further homogenising the American character increasingly transforming individuals into self-absorbed, peer-driven, materialistic, superficial conformists who are fast losing their ability to see beyond their increasingly circumscribed existences. The daring and courage that Mumford believed had been the hallmark of American progress was fast melting into the absalt of suburbia. Quote, In the mass movements to suburban areas, a new kind of community was produced which caricatured both the historic city and the archetypal suburban refuge. A multitude of uniform, unidentifiable houses lined up inflexibly at uniform distances, on uniform roads, in a treeless communal waste, inhabited by people in the same class, the same income, the same age group, witnessing the same television performances, eating the same tasteless, prefabricated foods from the same freezers, conforming in every outward and inward respect to a common mould, unquote. If Mumford was, a, was correct about suburban life, it would only be a matter of time before many of the children who grew up in such an environment would question such a soulless existence and rebel against all that was synthetic, superficial, bland and standardised. Equally trenchant in his criticism of suburbia and admonishment of the middle-class consumption was the Harvard economist John Kenneth Galbraith. In The Affluent Society, 1958, he expressed disquiet about Americans' penchant to accept whatever Madison Avenue advertised as they mindlessly spent their money on all manner of essentially useless products, which at the time of purchase were touted as the latest must-have item. As Galbraith observed, quote, the family which takes its mauve and serais air-conditioned, power-steered and power-braked automobile out for a tour, passes through cities that are, that are badly paved, made hideous by litter, blighted buildings, billboards and posts for wires that should long have been put underground. They pass into a countryside that has been rendered invisible by commercial art. The goods which the latter advertise have an absolute priority in our value system. Such aesthetic considerations as a view of countryside accordingly come second. On such matters, we are consistent. They picnic on an exquisitely packaged food from a portable icebox by a polluted stream and go on to spend the night at a park which is a menace to public health and morals. Just before dozing off on an air mattress beneath a nylon tent, amid the stench of decaying refuse, 
they may reflect vaguely on the curious unevenness of their blessingness, of their blessings. Is this indeed the American genius? Unquote. In his book, Galbraith called on Americans to curtail private consumption and support more public spending on infrastructure, cleaning up the environment, cultural activities, social services, and other aesthetic endeavours. In Gail Braith's view, 1950s white middle-class Americans had become consumed by their own consumption, allowing a crass materialism and acquisitiveness to define their daily lives. Becoming other-directed, bland and self-absorbed individuals with no sense of imagination, creativity or an individuality. According to the Marxic, Marxist critical theorist Herbert Marcuse, American society and culture was fast becoming one-dimensional. A country of uniform people consuming standardised products, creating a mass culture by which capitalist elites marketed goods, muted class tensions and in general legitimised the existing social order with all its inequities as wholly desirable and natural. Marcuse asserted that the white middle class suburban Americans' obsession with social status, belonging and material security had made them oblivious to their own despair and alienation. Contemporary indictments and subsequent rejection of, of suburban culture had little effect on white Americans' continued love affair with suburbia. Indeed, for millions of Americans, suburban life was a dream come true. Houses are for people, not critics, asserted Levitt. We who produce lots of houses do what is possible, no more, and the people for whom we do it think it's pretty good. He also said. Indeed, as Levitt told Time magazine, in Levittown, 99% of the people pray for us. Perhaps Levitt's arrogance was not totally unwarranted. For as one Levitt owner, ex-GI Wilbur Schatzel, who had been living in a one-bedroom apartment with his wife and a relative before he moved to Levittown, told the same magazine his previous living condition was, quote, awful, I'd rather not talk about it. Getting this house was like being emancipated, unquote. Suburbia was far from utopia, but it was not the social disaster some claimed. Americans in particular seemed to require lots of space around them, and by the 1950s, more citizens could come to afford to fulfil that desire, and the William Levitts were there to provide them with such an opportunity. Like Henry Ford, the post-war period's great tract home builders had found ways to offer the great multitude an essential component, component of the American dream affordable home ownership, a feat that portended to remake the, nas the nation's socio-cultural, economic and even political landscape. America in the 1950s concealed more turbulence and tension than a casual observer might have guessed. The America portrayed in mass media and promoted and reinforced by advertising was that of a nation of affluent white people. They were all living in their own spacious suburban homes, complete with the latest gadgets, reflecting the genius of American corporate innovation and the bounty available to all, as long as they were all white, because of the wonders of the capitalist free enterprise system. Indeed, the picture of 1950s Americans as prosperous, secure, proud, happy, hard-working people who would achieve the most enviable standard of living in the world was considered by policymakers to be an essential component of the nation's Cold War ideology. If the fundamental premise of American Cold War policy was to contain communism on a global scale, then any threatening social aberrations or questioning of the status quo at home had to be suppressed by reinforcing at all times the gospel of domesticity, consumption and clear gender roles. Both dom Democratic and Republican politicians embraced this notion, committed to ideologically defending the American way of life from assaults from abroad. For many American policymakers, suburbia represented the promise and triumph of American capitalism, and that particular way of life had to be promoted and defended as the key bulwark against the forces of international communism. As the man most responsible for suburbia's creation, William Levitt succinctly declared, quote, no man who owns his own house can be a communist. He has too much to do, unquote. 1950s corporate mass culture proved very adept at masking and manipulating reality. The nation was certainly not all white. The labour force had not transitioned to a completely white-collar workforce of college-educated technocrats and middle managers. 
and is Betty Friedan poignantly established in The Feminine Mystique. A high percentage of suburban women were far from fulfilled housewives. Prosperity byproducts, rampant materialism, a standardised mass culture and the growth of a desk-bound white-collar class of organisation men created far more anxieties than anyone dared reveal. Looking for relaxation from such pressures and tension, many beleaguered middle-class suburbanites, husbands as well as wives, found momentary solace in the nostrums of alcohol and prescription drugs, a good stiff martini or tranquilizers such as Valium. Indeed, drinking rose sharply in the 50s, and so did the sale of barbiturate drugs, which reached £1,159,000 consumed by 1959. Seeking relief from a multitude of stresses by washing sedatives down with a highball became a respectable adult addiction. Adult addiction. That such emotional and psychological distress should accompany affluence and material abundance surprised few psychologists or psychiatrists. White Americans had been afflicted with the anxieties caused by rising expectations throughout most of their history and thus for many 1950s middle-class citizens, unrealised aspirations often resulted in depression, requiring drugs or alcohol or both to soothe away the mental anguish of perceived failure. Suburbia offered white Americans a cherished dream, which they were supposed to feel fulfilled. But often, quote, nothing is more hopeless than planned happiness, unquote. By the early 1960s, the mainstream media had tired of the beat phenomenon. Their initial commercial cachet had run its course. The vast majority of Americans by then either seemed bored, disgusted or mildly amused by beat behaviour. The beats, like many other 1950s momentary diversions from the status quo, had been a fad. Nonetheless, during the placid 1950s, the beat scene was the only revolution around, and to the far seeing, it appeared a foretaste of more to come. By that time, many of the San Francisco poets had moved away, while the cops and tourists forced the rest from their old North, North Beach haunts. A few survived, however, finding a safe sanctuary in another congenial San Francisco neighbourhood, the Height Ashbury, a racially integrated community of 40 square blocks, adjacent to a scenic Golden Gate Park. There, beat old-timers not only preserved the hip lifestyle, but inspired a growing community of new hipsters, the hippies, to pick up where they had left off with their Dionysian projects. Despite the Beat's fleeting fame, their literature, their reckless lifestyle, and perhaps most important, their wholesale rejection of middle-class suburbia and its attendant values, they touched a spiritual restlessness in the hearts and minds of many more American youth than anyone dared to admit. By 1951, Allen Ginsberg wrote Jer Jack Kerouac, quote, I can't believe that between the three of us, meaning Ginsberg, Kerouac and William Burroughs, Already we had the nucleus of a totally new, historical, important American creation, unquote. At the time, Ginsburg self-congratulating self sounded like youthful arrogance. Over half a century later, it sounds like bemused prophecy, for the beat movement anticipated the counterculture of the 1960s. 